Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. I always jump the gun on, on, <laughs> on the webinar live stream notifications, which one is the right one. Uh, but good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Koresh Ali Lansana. Welcome to Changing the Narrative, um, conversations about race, equity, and beyond. Um, Changing the Narrative is a series that is now over a year old. Um, and it is brought to you by the Center for Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, of which I serve as director, the Center for Poets and Writers with Dr. Lindsay Smith as director, the Center for Public Life with Dr. Mike Stout and Dr. Tammy Moore Lee, uh, Lee Moore, I should say, as co-directors, and then the Center for Family Resilience with Dr. Brooke Tuttle at the helm there, and also with Tri-City Collective. We are happy you are here with us today for a special edition of changing the narrative. Changing the narrative usually occurs on the third Tuesday of the month at noon. Um, but we're having a special edition of changing the narrative today because we have a special scholar with us today to uh, to celebrate her scholarship and her work and 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 celebrate the women um, who are at the center of her work. And so we are very happy to kick off Women's History Month with Dr. well soon to be Dr. Autumn Brown um, and so I'm speaking on her dissertation um, uh, regarding and I think I didn't mention the Center for Africana Studies when my introduction and Dr. Erica Townsend Bell who is with us today so my apologies for that sis. Um, so we're here again to to celebrate Women's History Month with um, with some really wonderful and amazing and very important scholarship uh, from Autumn Brown, who was a PhD candidate in social foundations at OSU. Um, and really think about, again, in terms of this state, the state of Oklahoma and the state of Oklahoma's importance um, historically in terms of civil rights, particularly um, civil rights regarding black folks um, in this state. Um, and in the country, really, the Oklahoma was really a battleground and a litmus test for most of the most significant, most of the more significant civil rights legislation that had passed in the last century. Um, and Autumn's work, um, which you're going to hear from and learn from here in a moment, really centers in this, this history of uh, the, the the woven history of, of both overt and subtle acts of uh, resistance to racial injustice in this state. Um, and throughout the state's history, there have been members of the Black community who have resisted the dominant social order of Jim Crow and segregation. And Autumn is going to, to share with us some information, some chapters from her dissertation that focus really on three very, very important Black women um, to this state, really, and to this nation. Um, and then after... Uh, Autumn's presentation, Dr. Townsend Bell and I will engage Autumn in conversation regarding uh, what we just heard, what we just learned. Um, you are also more than welcome to put your questions in the chat because um, you may have some. And, um, and I think we're, we're ready to sit down and learn something from soon to be Dr. Autumn Brown who just picked up her PhD gown she just told me and will never take it off after after walking across that stage, and that's okay because you earned it. Um, and Dr. Brown, I keep calling you Dr. Brown because we're just going to claim it. We're going to own it, right? I'm going to so get used to hearing it. <laughs> yeah, yep. So Dr. Brown is from Oklahoma City originally, um, and we are very pleased that you are here to kick off Women's History Month with, with an important, in my opinion, of some of the most significant women um, in, 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 in the 20th century, and certainly some of the most important Black women in the state, in the history of this state. So Autumn, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Q, and thanks, um, Dr. Townsend Bell, for having me here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. So today's presentation, Oklahoma Teachers in the Movement, Here's an outline of kind of what I'll be covering. Um, I'll start with the historical overview of Black women's activism, and then I'll move into how Black women display and perform acts of activism. And then that will segue into my discussion about teacher activism and civil rights. I will go into um, Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher's story, as well as Nancy Randolph Davis's story. My dissertation, though, focuses primarily on Clara Looper. Um, and so I'll 
dig into Claire Looper a little bit more in depth before concluding and talking about the implications of this work. But before I begin, um, I just, just a quick tidbit about how I got to this research project and kind of my journey here. I'd spent three, four years focusing on STEM education and Black women in STEM. And after I finished all of my coursework, I just, I hit a roadblock. I was just like, I couldn't write. And I had no motivation for my topic. A lot of the literature I read about Black women's experiences in STEM and higher education were very negative, and I just, it just became too much. And so I took a minute to just take a step back and take, think about what I wanted to do with the PhD, the type of research I wanted to put out there, and what I wanted to essentially base my scholarship and my life's work around. And I kind of went back to my dad. My dad was a former student of Clara Looper and Nancy Randolph Davis. He grew up in Spencer, Oklahoma, which is where I spent a lot of my childhood growing up in Spencer, Oklahoma. And I started to just think about how instrumental these women were in my dad's life and as a byproduct in my life and just in Oklahoma in general. And so when I started revisiting these oral stories that he would tell me and started doing research about these women and their contributions, I realized that what they did for the state and especially for the civil rights movement is something that deserves a space in literature and deserves to be talked about and spread more widely. So um, Shout out to the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program where I am a research professional and Sarah Milligan for giving me the space to create these archives and special shout out to Dr. Lucy Bailey who has put up with me years in this um, last minute kind of dissertation change. So um, that is kind of what we will be talking about in today's presentation. So beginning with the, um, I need to minimize this. So beginning with an historical overview of Black women's activism, I start off by talking about Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. And she was a member of the Underground Railroad, Railroad and an anti-slavery speaker. And she says, the world cannot move without women's sharing in the movement and to help give a right impetus to that movement is women's highest privilege. Historians often discount Black women's activist accounts. Part of that issue is rooted in um, what gets recognized as activism is very narrow. But as Frances Ellen Watkins says, you know, women have always shared in the movement, and it has been a privilege for women to share in the movement. So when we think about Black women's activism, you know, we can we can go back centuries to see how Black women have performed activism and carried out activist activity even while being enslaved. Um, <clears throat> scholarship on activism has historically been shaped by white patriarchal dominance that has often concealed the work of women. Um, so for example, until recent decades, women's contributions have remained hidden in anti-slavery rebellion um, accounts, and that also includes women like Maria Stewart, who was the first Black woman to um, publicly speak out about women's rights. And she represents an early account um, of resistance and racial, gender, and class oppression. And in her 833 address, she puts a call out to the daughters of Africa, saying, it is of no use, it is of no use for us to sit with our hands folded, hanging our heads like bulrushes, lamenting our wretched condition. But let us make a mighty effort and arise. And if no one will promote or respect us, let us promote and respect ourselves. And so she calls for these daughters of Africa to develop intellect, become teachers, work outside of the home, and refute, refute a subservient um, way of life. And I really think that this is an early civil rights activist account because she speaks to the impact of education and the role that Black women played in, the, in those liberatory efforts. And so um, various scholars have highlighted Harriet Tubman's role in anti-slavery rebellions and her active role, role in freedom voyages, but she also served as the head of intelligence services in the Department of the South during the Civil War. And so it's often, often we see accounts of women who are displaying activism, kind of their work being reduced in a way. 
And so when we start thinking about Black women's activism, um, I like to start with this book by Crystal Sanders. It's a chance for change, a head start um, in Mississippi's Black freedom struggle. And so what Sanders did was she collected 2,500 oral stories from women who um, were previously sharecroppers and maids who, um, who became teachers. And they eventually leveraged their teaching within the Child Development Group of Mississippi. And what they did was they riled up their community members to speak out and against um, inferior statuses, against Jim Crow. And, but, the, but the interesting part about what she, how she conceptualizes this work is showing how these women who often would be discounted or discredited because of their um, status on the hierarchy, the social hierarchy, they were able to transition and um, become educators and then use their role as educators to leverage uh, and organize and activate support among their community and among other Black Americans in their, in their communities. So, um, Activism may exist in varied forms throughout various spaces, including the act of teaching. So Patricia Hill Collins posits that Black women's activism in the United States has occurred in two ways. The most dominant way that we think about activism is a struggle for institutional transformation. So we think of activism to end desegregation or to end segregation for voting rights, right? We're, we're institutionally transforming um, the, the socio-political world. But she also looks at the struggle for group survival, which is a lesser known form of activism, but it is something that I frame in my research as very important. Struggles for group survival, right? And so I think about art and music and teaching and how teachers during this civil rights era were more than just teachers. They were like an extension of the home. They were parents. They were friends, they were neighbors. You know, my dad talked about um, picking cherries from Nancy Randolph Davis's cherry trees. And, you know, they talk, he talks about her being his home ec teacher and popping up at, it, at his house. And so making sure that the house was clean and, you know, uh, making, and just wanting to, um, wanting to impress his teachers. And so I think about these, the struggle for group survival as an important form of activism, because when we think about how Black women display and perform activism, a lot of it, though it is for institutional transformation, a lot of it is for group survival, especially when we look at how Black women taught and how they use their classrooms, classrooms as political sites. And so when we think about activism, we have to in include the fact that there was a time in history when Black women were excluded from certain labor unions and political parties. And because of this exclusion, they had to find other ways to perform activism. So that's where Patricia Hill Collins's um, theoretical framework about you know, Black women and activism comes into play because historical accounts will leave out how Black women performed um, or participated in their community because historically they were excluded from these traditional forms of activism. So we've talked a little bit about histo a historical overview of activism, and we've talked about how Black women perform activism. So my research really looks at Black women teacher activists. I'm really unpacking this idea of teacher activists because we see women like Clara Luper and Ada Fisher and Nancy Randolph Davis who were educators in their own right. Clara Luper taught history, Nancy Randolph Davis taught home economics, and um, Ada Fisher taught higher ed in the political science department at Langston University. So these women were all teachers, but when studying their pedagogy and how they carried out their teaching, you see remnants of activism throughout their teaching. Um, with Clara Luper specifically, she was a history teacher. So she used history as a way to engage her students in the um, in civil discourse. You know, she used the U.S. Constitution as a way of justifying their sit-in movements. And 
when we think about segregated schooling and the lack of materials and the funding that they got, which I'm going to talk a little bit about a re-narration of segregated schooling later on, but when we think about all that they were lacking, we have to think about the material ways that these teachers were able to engage their students and, you know, make up for what they didn't have in the classrooms. And that was a lot of hands-on activity, and it was a lot of connecting their their subject matter with the students' real lives, real, real world lives. And so when we think about Looper, she was able to engage her students by showing them like, hey, you're growing up in segregation. This is your world. But let's look at history and what history says about us as humans and our human rights and things like that. And so she was able to kind of leverage that subject to get her students involved in the movement. So um, Jay Inwood says the most radical thing one can do is teach. So when we think about activist teaching, um, I look at it as a welcoming of genuine inquiry to avoid forcing students to share the beliefs of the teacher. So, you know, a lot of people think about teaching as like a banking model. They think of students coming in with no knowledge and it's up to the teacher to just fill them up. But on the contrary, students are coming in with their own knowledges based on their real world experiences. And so a teacher is not meant to indoctrinate their students into believing what they believe, but instead welcoming their own personal experiences, their question, genuine inquiries, and kind of helping to shape that, not shape as in let me indoctrinate you, but shape that as in if you have a genuine inquiry or a genuine issue that you see with around with the world around you, what are some ways that you can approach that? Um, and then it engages with the multiple perspectives that students bring into the classroom. So it understands that our students are coming into the classroom with some type of knowledge. And it's not for us to discredit, but instead it's for us to engage in those perspectives, which creates a really diverse um, way of thinking in the classroom if I'm missing anything. So critical scholar William Ayers, he also says that teaching is more than transmitting skills, but it's a living act and it involves preference and value, obligation and choice, trust and care, commitment and justification. So the contributions of Black women educators on contemporary educational pedagogy and theorizing have often been been unnoticed. In fact, often Black women um, prove their respectability by attaining higher education. And due to both racial and gender depression, these Black women experience, um, they, um, they kind of, uh, they pursued this uh, idea of a purposeful womanhood, which meant motivating more Black youth to value themselves and to do something of value in a world that has failed to recognize them as valuable. So during the period of civil rights, these women were more than followers. And sometimes literature will point to the fact that Black women were fearful of speaking out against the status quo, that they just kind of followed and stayed in their lane. But that is not entirely true. Black women use their classrooms as political spaces to activate and organize their students. And so during the period of civil rights, these women were more than just followers, but they were very integral in mobilizing a sit-in movement, mobilizing protests and boycotts. Um, so Tanya Loder Jackson does a great job of looking at teachers in Birmingham, Alabama, and the role that they played in the civil rights movement. Similarly, Derek Allridge and his Teachers in the Movement project is looking at teachers throughout the South, Black and white, men and women, and studying the important role that they played in civil rights so that we can kind of start to re-narrate this discourse about how important teachers were in the civil rights movement, although sometimes we don't really see historically that come into fruition. Um, let's see. So operating, um, Siddle Walker and Archong say that operating in closed cultural communities and without direct intervention of whites, Black teachers were able to create schools that were very different from what the government intended that they would become. So when we think about Jim Crow and what segregation did personally and just on a human level, it really kind of, um, 
it reiterated this idea of inferiority. And so when we think about segregated schools and the rhetoric around that, the rhetoric, the rhetoric is that, that they were inferior, that the type of education was less than, but that's not actually the case. I mean, yes, systemically they were underfunded. They didn't have the same, you know, materials as their white school counterparts, but these teachers were really able to do something special in these segregated schools. They created hands-on lessons. They were interdisciplinary teachers. A lot of the students that Clara Looper had say, I don't know how she was able to teach us all the things that she was able to teach us. She was our history teacher, but I can think of algebra that I learned from Clara Looper. And I still remember her teaching us keyboard and how to type by writing the keys on the board and, and teaching us how to type you know, um, using our tables. And so I'm really, my research is really, although it really is focusing, it's an educational biography of Clara Looper, sprinkled throughout my research is really just this um, re-narration about how special segregated schools were. Not to say that we should romanticize them, but there was definitely um, a form of capital, community capital that was, um, garnered in these schools that, you know, social capital, community capital, these were proud institutions of pride. And so scholarship on Black women teachers during civil rights is growing, but it's still largely missing from academic discourse, both historically and in the present day, which is why it's so important that scholars such as Vanessa Siddlewalker and Tanya Loder Jackson and Derek Allrich are kind of re- reframing um, teachers during civil rights and making sure that their work in the movement is credited and is foregrounded. And so these women displayed liberatory efforts and those liberatory efforts that they displayed in the classroom were tremendous, had a tremendous influence both inside and outside of the classroom. So what they did in the classroom really carried over into how they um, interacted, engaged with the community. When we look at how Looper was a teacher and the work that she did, everywhere that she showed up, she showed up as a teacher, whether it was in the classroom as a formal teacher or whether it was in her living room where her students would meet on Monday, on the, in the evenings to organize for the civil rights movement or whether it was um, while she was protesting and sitting in at Cat's Drugstore or John A. Brown's or, Do or Dodo's Amusement Park. Um, these teachers were able to show up as teachers and as activists in every capacity that they were in. So Adam Fairclaw says that there was a special sense of dedication in Black teachers that helped them compensate for the material deficiencies of the schools. And that's just really important to, again, I can't, I can't say enough how we have to credit these Black teachers for, you know, providing a level of education that they were never supposed to provide and creating such an intergenerational impact on their students to the point where now, you know, I'm two generation, I'm a generation away from Claire Looper and Nancy Randolph Davis's impact, but there's st the, the reverberations can still be seen. And it's our job now as contemporary ed um, teacher activists to study our, um, our foremothers and pay homage to the work that they did, but also make sure that those care those stories continue to carry on generation to generation to generation. So when we talk about the civil rights movement, we have to talk about the fact that it began with grassroots movements and local communities, and women were a large part of the this leadership. However, Black women as leaders in the movement remain a category of invisible. One thing that, I mean, is important for me is thinking about Emmett Till and the fact that his mother, Mammy, made such a brave decision to have an open casket. And, you know, she says, I want the world to see what, you know, I want the world to see what they did to my baby. And that decision is not something to be taken lightly. And it's not something to just gloss over because the national, the national run of Emmett Till's mangled body really was a catalyst for the larger civil rights movement that we study today. I mean, thinking about um, what kind of shock that that must have been in that 
period of time to see a 14 year old boy in that kind of condition for allegedly whistling at a white woman, which we know now that he, that was a lie. But I say all that to say that, you know, we often think about the civil rights movement and we talk about Martin Luther, or yeah, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and John Lewis, but we kind of gloss over this decision made by a single mother and how that, that single decision had such a reverberating effect that, you know, we were able to kind of like springboard that into the larger civil rights movement. So I kind of like to lead with that just to show that women's involvement in the civil rights movement was major. Um, also, and I'll talk a little bit about this when I talk about Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher, but the civil rights movement was largely patriarchal as well. And so, you know, it had its faults, I'll say that. And so when we talk about Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher, um, okay. And I'm just going to disclaim, give a disclaimer now. I my dissertation is really focusing on Clara Looper, but my future research will include Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher and Nancy Randolph Davis. So I'm going to give just some information about Fisher and Davis, and then we'll go into Clara Looper more broadly. But Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher was born February 8, 1934, in Chickasha, Chickasha, Oklahoma. Interestingly enough, her parents were. Chickasha transplants after seeking refuge um, after the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. So I think it's very interesting that, you know, Fisher's lineage, lineage really kind of goes through Tulsa. And when we think about her family settling in Chickasha as a byproduct of the massacre. But what my educational biography is doing is rebuking this idea of a single heroine, right? So most biographies really look at one figure and just say like, this figure did everything. But what I want my biography to do is show that while I'm looking at Clara Looper, I'm also looking at these other social networks that helped her in her movement, that inspired her or that um, were involved. So when I think about Ada Fisher, I think about her as a key figure in Looper's network. She's a legend in her own right. She was born February 8th. Her parents were um, Tulsa Race Massacre transplants, and she had a brother named Lemuel and a sister named Helen. Looper, um, like, I mean, Fisher, like Looper, attended segregated, segre segregated secondary schooling, and she graduated from Lincoln High School in 1941. She was also valedictorian. She initially enrolled in college at Arkansas A&M at Pine Bluff in 1941, but she eventually transferred to Langston University in 1942, where she met her close friends, Clara Looper and Nancy Randolph Davis, while they were living in the same dorm room. Fisher is most notably known as the plaintiff in the case Scipio versus Board of Regents of the University of Oklahoma. And this case, this historical case is one that Fisher undertook because Black students were prohibited to attend school with white students. And when I, again, when we talk about black students being prohibited from attending schools from white students, this was a law, meaning if white students were caught in class with black students, they would be um, charged a fine. And the professor who was teaching black students would be charged a fine for teaching black students. So this was more than just, you know, you can't, can't sit here. This was a law that Ada Lois Sipiel wanted to overturn. Um, Langston did not have a law school. And so, you know, OU was the only law school. This case is a precursor to Brown versus Board of Education. Um, very important. Sipiel's case was six years before Brown. And um, it's important to know that Fisher was not the first choice for this case, which brings me back to how patriarchal this movement was. They wanted her brother Lemuel, first of all, but he didn't want, he just, he wanted to go to Howard. He didn't want to deal with the PWI. He wanted to go to Howard. This year was like, I'll do it. But they were like, nah, they went down to Texas. They um, interviewed another black man because Thurgood Marshall was just not sold on Fisher being the, the, the plaintiff for this case. And so again, civil rights, patriarchal, like, you know, thinking about women as leaders, um, that we don't see that often, even though they were organizing behind the scenes. I did talk to a civil rights um, 
legend, Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons. And what she taught told me was that, yes, like there was very much sexual assault happening in organizations like SNCC and SCLC. And there was, but there was also this internal um, dilemma between black women and black men, because while the women knew that they were doing the organizing behind the scenes, they were aware that they needed a black male as the figurehead, as the leader. And so that was def um, gender was definitely very salient throughout this period of time. And so um, again, I've talked a little bit about like social networks and how important they were during this period of time. And so what's important when we think about this three year long battle that Fisher went to desegregate um, OU's law school, she had strong and wide social networks that were very important. So let's see, where do I have it here? So she had a strong sideline backing as she pursued her legal battles. For example, before her law team went to argue the case in front of the Supreme Court, they stopped in and practiced with students at Howard University. Um, these students at this HBCU in Washington, D.C. were very um, steadfast with, you know, um, helping her legal battles, with preparing her lawyers for the Supreme Court. And Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher says in an oral history interview, she said, we went to the law school, which was a black law school at Howard University. The law faculty and the junior and senior class stars met with us at the courtroom and they drilled Marshall and the other lawyers like Dutch uncles. They threw every possible question, every possible adverse motion and preparing them to be great, ready for anything that comes up for tomorrow. So an example like this shows how broad and deep these social networks um, ran throughout the Black community, and it lends itself to this idea of how cohesive the community was and the way that the members within the community would band together for a common cause. And this idea is really important because, again, in talking to Dr. Simmons, I asked her a little bit about, like, how can you talk, how can you compare um, black, the Black movement, the Black civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s to the type of racism that we're seeing now. And the thing that she really talked about was this idea of unity that existed then that doesn't necessarily exist now. So when we think about these social networks that Ada Lois Sibiel Fisher and Looper and Nancy Randolph Davis were able to tap into, even um, a student from OU able to get help from, you know, some of the top Black lawyers at Howard University, it shows that this kind of co cohesive community bubble among Black people crossed state lines and were, was all over the nation. But one thing that Dr. Simmons says now when we think about, you know, um, as the government is slowly rolling back these, the legislation that we fought for in civil rights, that this level of unity is not around now. And that's a whole other conversation about race and sociology that we're not going to get into, but it is an interesting concept. Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher, after practicing law for some time, did um, return back to her alma mater, Langston University, where she worked in the political science department and eventually became a department head. And then we have Nancy Randolph Davis, who I owe a personal Thank you too, because of her bravery. I am a student here at Oklahoma State University. Um, and I just think about, you know, again, when we think about paying homage to our ancestors, I think every day about what she had to go through, the bravery it took for her to attend this PWI when most Black people at the time were just going to Kansas or the surrounding states. I think about the fact that her bravery is the reason why I'm here now pursuing doctoral studies. So I definitely say that I stand on the shoulders of Nancy Randolph Davis. Um, she was born in 1926. Her great, great grandparents were enslaved persons. And so, you know, I think when we talk about historical context, we have to include the fact that slavery, Jim Crow, like those are not that far away in time, right? Like my dad attended segregated schooling. So I'm only one generation away from Jim Crow and three or four generations away from slavery. And so um, for Nancy Randolph Davis, she was two generations away from slavery. She was also a Langston graduate, good friends with Clara Looper. 
Um, education was very, very important in her family. Um, she says that you had to get education no matter what. That was just, that was the thing. Um, she eventually graduated from Langston in 1948 in a home, with a home economics degree. And then against the historical backdrop of Jim Crow legalized se segregation, she became the first black student to enroll at Oklahoma A&M, which is now Oklahoma State in 1940, 1949. In 2021, 2021, OSU renamed one of the human sciences and education buildings in the college in tribute to Davis. And if you're ever on campus in Stillwater, there is a um, statue of Davis that is similar to this picture here, paying homage to her. She was a home ec teacher at Dungy for 20 years where she worked alongside Clara Looper. And then after Oklahoma City Schools desegregated, she became a home ec teacher and child care instructor at Star Spencer, also located in Spencer, Oklahoma. She had a 43-year 43, 43 teaching career. The same way that Nancy Randolph Davis was an inspiration to her students like my dad, a young Nancy was first inspired by her teachers in high school and in college kind of like her high school principal, Mr. Williams, who had an early influence on her going to college and her high school teacher, Mitty Jackson, whose influence inspired Davis to pursue home ec. Home ec was a subject that Davis, that captured Davis's attention. And it's the subject that lent, her, lent itself to her strength. So in her high school, home ec was a vital strand throughout her school's culture, mainly due to a societal culture of Jim Crow. In an oral history interview, Davis said, we did a little bit of serving food for the high school football teams because the football team couldn't go to a restaurant and eat. So we served the boys after the football games every Friday night that we had a game. I was one of those who volunteered to serve. So when we think about this idea of teacher activism, Nancy Randolph Davis is definitely a teacher activist. Her passion for home ec was fostered while she attended high school in Sepulpa, but then how she was trained to be a home ec teacher was um, later, how she was trained to become a home ec teacher was rooted in her time and her influence at Langston University. She involved her home ec students in organizations such as the Young Homemakers Group, um, which didn't have many Blacks that were participating. Um, there were also fashion shows that she put on every Christmas with teacher aides. Um, and those fashion shows drew a lot of people in the community. And um, she remained in touch with the community needs and she engaged her students in home ec in a way that was instrumental outside of the classroom. So she had her students make clothes and uh, make things for the house. So home ec was definitely, her home ec class definitely offered extensions into her students' real lives and real worlds outside of school. My favorite thing about Nancy Randolph Davis though, Everything you read, she's like, I'm a woman of God and a woman of faith, but she was not a very much a nonviolent participant. Um, in Clara Looper's memoir, she talks about telling Nancy, just go ahead and sit this one out, because one thing she just could not get behind was seeing children mistreated. And like her daughter, Nancy Lynn Davis said, that was one way for her to lose her religion was to see children be mistreated. And so um, there was one sit-in that they were gonna do a squat in where they just laid there and anything they did, you know, they had to just lay there. And she said, Nancy, go ahead and sit this one out because this will be a, a fight in if you are at this, this demonstration. And so, Nancy did a lot of organizing an Oklahoma City movement behind the scenes by preparing food for the students and giving them supplies, but she could not, she couldn't get behind the nonviolent when it came to, um, you know, hurting students. So I love that. I loved learning that about her because I often think about the practicality of nonviolence, especially when you're seeing children being spat on and just dehumanized. And so this really kind of like humanized Nancy Davis for me. So now we're gonna get into Clara Looper. She was born in Oak Fusky County, which is her hometown. Um, a town that definitely shaped her disdain for um, an instance that definitely shaped her disdain 
for segregation was when her brother Ulysses died from pneumonia. He got sick and they took him to the hospital in Henrietta, but Henrietta was a sundown town. Because he was black, they wouldn't see him. And so um, they had to take him to the nearest hospital that accepted black people, but on the commute, he ended up passing away. He didn't have to die. Um, although he had pneumonia, it was definitely the institution of segregation that killed him. And so Clara Looper talks a lot about how this was a very influential time in her life because she was able to see just, I mean, there were other instances, but this instance she says was the most dear to her because, you know, her brother didn't have to die. Um, and so one thing about Clara, she loved to read and she longed to visit a library. She was educated at what she calls a fireside university. So she didn't come from family with much education. Her grandmother could barely read or write. Her mother and father only had like elementary school education. But again, her family very much placed much emphasis on education. And what they knew, they passed down to her. And so her dad would have her take notes in church, memorize poems, and basically provided an, a type of informal education for Clara that definitely rooted inside of her to see how education could be uh, mobilizing, could have a mobilizing impact. Um, following in the footsteps of her close friend Ada Fisher, she became the first black student admitted into the graduate program for history at OU and working with Nancy Randolph Davis. She was a history teacher at Dundee schools from 1950 to 1968. So the purpose of my dissertation was to uncover the educational contributions of Clara Looper, both inside and outside of the classroom within her historical milieu to create a narrative portrait of her teacher activism. So in essence, um, my dissertation wanted to look at Clara Looper as a teacher and as an activism integrated with each other. A lot of the literature on Looper really focuses in on her activism in the sit-in movement. Um, she's known as the mother of civil rights here in Oklahoma City. So a lot of articles and renderings of Looper really point to her sit-in movement that she spearheaded with her students. But she was a teacher. And it was in her classroom that she was able to leverage her role as a teacher, build trust with her students and her students as parents, and use her subject matter of history to show her students why participating in the student movement was important for their humanity. And so what my dissertation is doing is basically just describing and unpacking her work, explaining what she did, explaining some of the um, intergenerational impacts of her work, pulling in a variety of sources such as archival material. I use her memoir, I've collected oral histories, and I'm pulling secondary sources. So I'm gonna talk about Looper as a strategist. Um, she wrote the play Brother President, which was um, based loosely on Martin Luther King Jr. When she learned about this young pastor and his doctrine of nonviolence, she was inspired because it was rooted in Christianity and it was rooted in religion. So she put on this play, Brother President. It was um, picked up by the national office and um, the national NAACP, and she was asked to perform it in New York City. Interestingly enough, um, the initial offer was only to take four or five students. Claire Looper said, no, you're taking them all because they all, you know, came to practice. They all, they all deserve to go. So again, we see this community networks because what she did was she rallied her community to raise money so that all of her students could participate on this trip. Well, she's a strategist because what she did was she took her students the northern route going to New York City so that they could experience segregate or in integrated lunch counters. And then coming back, she took the southern route. And so that she wanted her students to see the stark differences between integration and segregation. And so when they got, got back to Oklahoma, her students were compelled to do something. They got a taste of freedom and they wanted more. And so integrating public accommodations in Oklahoma City was their platform. Um, Looper was the youth advisor, uh, the advisor for the youth council, the Oklahoma City's youth council, um, NAACP youth council. And so, that was their thing. They were going to integrate public accommodations. They started um, organizing. They made plans. And it all began because Looper strategized 
taking your students the northern route and then the southern route coming home. Oops. Um, she did lead a lot of direct action protests. Her first direct action protest was with the Deaf, Blind, and Orphan School, which is the first place that she had that she began her teaching career. They wanted to take part of her check for the Democratic political party, and she said no. I'm not giving my money to the Democratic political party. And so she staged a protest demanding her right to a full paycheck. They took the money out anyway, and so she left DBO. She spearheaded the Oklahoma sit-in movement for six years, just desegregating public accommodations. She spearheaded the March to Lawton. She desegregated Dodo's amusement park there. And this March to Lawton started from Oklahoma, the Oklahoma City Capitol, and the group marched on foot to Lawton, Oklahoma to desegregate Dodo's amusement park. And I think that that is such a display of commitment and passion to a cause. Um, and again, we see Nancy Randolph Davis, her husband and her um, daughter, Nancy Lynn Davis were involved in this march. Nancy was involved and she was in charge of getting the food and um, supplies for this march um, ready for the group. And then she led the sanitation strike, which is probably the most controversial of her direct action protests. And um, I'll talk about why it's controversial. So okay. So when she led this um, sanitation strike, it was it was controversial. Um, for her role as a teacher, but it was also a controversial movement in Oklahoma City at large. And so um, when this was during a time where desegregation was already happening, so she had been transferred to Northeast and the first day of school was the first day of the strike. So she missed the first day of school so that she could be at the strike. And so what was happening was you saw where the school wanted to take her out of the classroom and give her a research assistant job and called this a promotion. But this was, I mean, you could kind of consider this a consequence for her um, protests, but she said no. And again, these community, community networks were very strong because, you know, while she opposed this job promotion, the community really backed her and really said, you know, we want her in the classroom. This is not okay. And it was really their influence that helped um, Clara Looper retain her position as a teacher. And so there were definitely consequences for her activism. So when we talk about the intersections of her political activism and her as an educator, this is definitely one of them. Let's see. So as I just wrap up, um, and talk about like some of the broader implications, like a study, um, an educational biography of Clara, Clara Looper, but essentially an educational biography of any Black woman teacher activist really offers um, varied forms of political activism for contemporary teachers to carry out. And it also highlights how strong these social networks were in the Black community, which helped make her political activism posit possible. And it contributes to the larger study of teacher activism for, rele for relevant contemporary te teacher activists. And then the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is this quote by Vanessa Siddlewalker, which says, to remember segregated schools largely by recalling only their poor resources presents a historically incomplete picture. So thank you guys for listening. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now um, and open it up for questions. Thank you, Autumn. Um, I learned some things that I didn't know, and it's sort of my jam. So I appreciate um, appreciate that. I want to open the floor to Dr. Uh, Townsend Bell, um, and then I will monitor the chat to see if any folks out in Cyberland have any any questions for you. So, Dr. Bell. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know if I have a question so much as just um, a, a, couple, a comment about, so I appreciated all of this and it was just that um, this work is so important and I'm, um, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm going to have to kind of reflect further on the pivot that you did, right? And like, the, I mean, the lessons for you, but the lessons that we take from that more broadly about what we're doing in this educational enterprise, right? And it's just, that's, I'm going to have to sit with that. But one of the things I really appreciated about the, um, the work that you're doing here and that I was really thinking about is this notion of kind of the fabric, right? And really kind of getting this much um, 
a more robust picture of the kind of work that people are doing and especially that black women are doing in the way that maybe if we approach these questions around um, actors in history from that perspective. So less of the highlights, right? It's Black History Month, we just finished Black History Month and it's like, did you know X did? And here's a one minute description. And when we go deeper, how much more we can engage. And I was really thinking about this because, um, you know, you said at one point, uh, what did you say? Um, you know, we're talking about Emma Tell's mom, right? And this really, really important work that she did that has gone unnoticed and unrecognized for so long that had this really, really um, important repercussions for the movement as a whole and for the work in, that it was able to do. And I was thinking of, of course, of the echoes of this with, and I'm so sorry to say that I don't know her name off the top of my head, but the young woman, the poor traumatized young woman who recorded the George Floyd incident, right? And these, and how we see this process continue on, right? We have these young women, these young or old, these women, black women who are stepping up, right? To help us to understand this hidden, you know, what would be otherwise hidden, um, hidden moments and to be able to contextualize them so that we can begin to, um, or continue, I should say rather, um, continue that, that fight back, right? And so that, I think that trajectory, this notion of the kind of the fabric that they're engaging in that you that you pull out um, is so um, is so incredibly important as well as the fabric and the work that they're doing right this notion that that home ec mm -hmm. not just home ec right but that mm -hmm. is, you know but through that mode the ability to um, to interface with so many of the needs of the black community right yeah. I think that's so so interesting and I guess I will end with one question for you this is more, I think maybe more of a future consideration you 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 know you started you mentioned Patricia Hill Collins you know suggestion that um we see struggles for group survival and we need to tell a lot more of those stories right and we see struggles for institutional transformation and then actually later on at some in one of your um slides I think you referenced maybe the other set of struggles that we have seen historically and that we are kind of continuing to tease which is the struggles for liberation mm -hmm. right so then the word is this where, where what part uh, where do we see the echoes of that historically, you know, and how do we begin to unpack those threads and then where might that go, right? Um, I think is, is um, an interesting question and maybe one you've already begun to engage with uh, and, and one you might carry on. It's actually not. So that's um, really amazing consideration. So thank you for kind of giving me that like third bullet, like activism struggles for liberation, because I think that that I mean, because then when we define liberation, like what does liberation look like? You know what I'm saying? Like that can have so many definitions. Like liberation can just be me being liberated enough to not, to speak my truth and not be scared to fall into this controlling image of an angry black woman, right? Or liberation on the other, like for the institutional liberation. So I think that that's impo uh, something important to unpack for sure. Erica, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to circle back to, in particular, to struggles for group survival, right? So I'm really taken by that phrase. So I'm wondering, Autumn, if you can provide us a, just a brief, a uh, little more clarity on what that, on what that means, what that is, and then also how that, how it manifests today versus in the civil rights era. So when I think about like struggles for group survival, I just think about like struggles to like ha experience joy and to just, you're living in a moment where this, the world around you is telling you you're subhuman, you're inferior. And so to me, it's like, when we think about struggles for um, institutional change, it's like you're eradicating those systems that like segregation, but for group survival, it, to me, it seems like um, allowing students joy. So like the play, the plays that she would put on about brother president or Harriet Tubman and engaging her students in something outside of school that was fun for them, whether it was um, participating in the play or behind the scenes. A lot of her students talked about, they can still recite um, some of the cheers and chants that she would teach them at, for football games and pep rallies. And they talk about the joy and the happiness and what it does for them even now being elders and being able to re recite those chants. And so I think about like um, for activism, for group survival, it's just like providing a space for Black people to experience happiness and experience joy and not constantly be subdued by this inferiority or subhuman nature. Um, I even think about, you know, like her living room, like um, that was definitely like a site of organizing, but it was also just a site where students could 
just be and come and like engage with other students and not just students from their school, but students from all over the city who are involved in the movement. And so I just think about, yeah, like thinking about instances where our activism isn't necessarily trying to fix a problem, but it's just trying to survive. I think about my work as activism for group survival. I mean, I started out trying to fix the world of STEM education and PWIs, right? Institutional transformation. Then I said, wait a minute, I didn't think I didn't cause the problems in PWIs. It's not my job to fix them. So I'm going to do something that brings me joy. And this research pro project, in a way, is how I was able to survive up until this point, because if not, I was still trying to evoke this institutional change. I don't think I would have made it this far and I definitely wouldn't have been happy. Okay, wow, thank you for that answer. Okay, so before um, before we close and we have Dr. Townsend Bell tell us about something pretty amazing that's happening in black space in, orange, in the orange world, um, Autumn, how would you very succinctly define purposeful womanhood? How would you define it today? Just being in your truth, standing in your truth and not, not, um, not subscribing to what society tells us a woman is supposed to be. And I think for Black women, we can define that as anything because womanhood was never afforded us to begin with. Femininity was never something that was afforded us at all. So purposeful womanhood is just defining womanhood on our own terms and not society's terms for us. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I, I, I would like for us to continue to build on that concept too. Um, all right, Dr. Bell, before we wrap up, tell folks what is happening tomorrow that is very important and very significant, please. Absolutely happy to. I will say real quickly before I say that, though, you know, listening to your your responses in these last couple of minutes, Autumn, I think we need another word or maybe we need to, to like coin purposeful womanhood. But I'm all, I almost want something um, beyond black survival. I feel I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about something like black thriving. Right. But we need like a better word for it, like survival. That's not it. <laughs> so we'll work on that. But um, yes, and I got in Maine. We are excited to. Um, and look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow here in Stillwater. So some of you might have to make a drive. Um, here in Stillwater, we are uh, celebrating the expansion of the Center for Africana Studies. We have a physical space that we are excited that uh, uh, for all the ways in which that will allow us to build on the kind of work that we have already been doing, right? That we um, saw um, so well represented in this, this space of learning an engagement here with the um, soon to be Dr. Brown, uh, who maybe we can instill back uh, to come join us in some way in the future, wouldn't that be great? Uh, so four to six, p well, 4 p.m., you don't say 06, four o'clock um, on the lawn of Life Sciences East. It looks like the weather is going to be our friend. So we will uh, be sharing some words. We will have some original poetry by a uh, renowned poet um, who you may have heard of, Koresh Ali Lanzana. Uh, and we will also be engaging um, in a community art project in the Dinkra Stamping um, Project to wrap up the festivities. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at four. Thank you, Dr. Townsend Bell. Um, and we, we do hope everyone comes out to uh, this expansion of the Africana, Center for Africana Studies, a physical space for Blackness and for um, the study of Blackness uh, at OSU in Stillwater is a significant achievement. Um, and I hope that you all will come out and help us celebrate, um, celebrate the significant achievement. Um, and so, and the, it just looked like the weather is going to be very good. So thank you, Dr. Townsend Bell, uh, for being with us today. And thank you, Autumn Brown, soon to be Dr. Autumn Brown, for your important scholarship. Um, and I think there's much more to come from you. Um, and we are excited about um, your future. Um, and a part of what this center is, a part of what the dedication for the center is tomorrow is about you is about celebrating you and um, your peers, the students, the black and brown, the BIPOC students, the woke students of any ethnicity at OSU who believe as we do, right? That knowledge of others is knowledge of self. Our histories are as clear, and I'll end with Clara Lupert's quote that you know 
is very important to me, which is that, you know, she said that it is my biggest job now to help white folks understand that black history is white history. We cannot separate the two. And that's real talk, y'all. So thank you for hanging out with us for this hour for changing the narrative. Our next, our regularly scheduled changing the narrative is on the 15th of this month, the 15th of March at noon. That will be led by Dr. Uh, Tammy Lee Moore and uh, Dr. Dion Lambert. Um, and so we hope you join us on the 15th at noon for that event. Thank you again. And everyone have a great week and enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Are we out? Okay.